Check, check. Now, Nate's going to be, ooh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> Nate's going to be uh, messing with the uh, sound, make sure we're tight. So if I move in and out, just call that my special effects, all right? Good morning, y'all. I say good morning, y'all. Good morning. Hit somebody with the book. All right. I want to I wanna talk a little bit about, see if I can get this to work, Nate. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't want y'all to see that yet. I want to talk a little bit about, we're doing a series called The Lies... We believers believe, lies Christians believe, and today I want to talk about the lie. Strong Christians do not struggle with depression, fear, and pain. Now, if I ask you to raise your hands, how many of you say that lie operates in your head? Raise your hand if you think that lie operates in your head a little bit. Okay, now, how many of you say, ah, oh, man, that... That's a lie. I can see that's a lie. Yeah, okay, okay. I'm, I'm going to show you to this morning that the lie digs in deep because it sounds crazy when you hear it. Strong Christians don't struggle with depression or fear or pain. Well, I know that isn't true, but I went to Crossroads yesterday and I counted books. And I counted about 30 titles that said things like this. Do you want victory over depression? Do you want to win the battle over anxiety? As if life on this side of the grave, can be that stuff can be eradicated. So today I want to talk about three things. One, what did Jesus say if the lie is embedded and even in the Christian industry we're selling that lie? What did Jesus say about this world we live in? Second thing I want to talk about is what does it really mean to be strong or weak in the faith? Okay. The third thing I want to talk about is if indeed some of you, notice I say some of you, are really weak, what are we going to do about it? Now, I'm weak too. And there seems to be a couple different connotations for weak. But if we indeed have and live in this body of death, if indeed we live in this place designed for this place, not for heaven, then we're going to struggle. And the last point I want to make in that today will be, what happens when we say to God, man, I can't, I can't do it anymore, or I can't stop this, or could you please take this away? And in 2 Corinthians, Paul, Jesus, Jesus jumps in Paul's face, and I want to share with you that. But the first thing I want to think about is this. You know, uh, I was sitting around thinking about this sermon. I've been thinking about it for a week or two when Mike asked me to preach it. And my mind goes to crazy places. So I was thinking about the lies. I was thinking about lies we believe. And I was was watching a commercial in the middle of thinking and kind of looking at Scripture. And there was that commercial that the dude comes on and says, Honey, does my butt look good, big in these pants? And everybody cracks up, right? I decided the real masculine question, especially when you get to that middle-aged, bulge time, is, honey, does my stomach look fat in this shirt? That's the real question, right? That's the real question. Men don't worry about their butts. They worry about this thing, (laughs) right? That's what we worry about, right? I'm thinking that's, that's another lie, right? We got this body, and Paul describes this body as a body of death. And we've been given this body to live here. This is a broke place. So let's, let's take this thing apart. Let's, let's take this thing apart. First of all, strong Christians don't struggle with depression, fear, and pain. What's Jesus have to say about it? If you look in your inserts, you'll see I ask a question. What does Jesus and the other saints say about 
life on this planet. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And then the disciples, because Jesus has been talking in riddles up to this point. But now we're coming to the deadline. Jesus is about to go to go to the cross. And he's been trying to say to his fellows, hey, look, man, three years ago, I told you I was going to die. Two years ago, I told you I'm going to die. I'm telling you now, two days from now, you will not have me. And the disciples say this. Now you're speaking clearly without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to, to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. You believe it at, at last, Jesus answered. But the time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that, so that in me you may have peace. Listen to what he says. Now put an underline. If you have pens, underline this last, this last phrase. And there's a whole bunch of other phrases that says this. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. In this world, you have trouble. I went on a, I went on a search. I looked up words, trouble, affliction, tribulation, trials, suffering. I couldn't count the scriptures that seem to indicate that if we become faithful people, holding on to the bootstraps of Christ, we will experience trouble, tribulations, trials, testings, sufferings, trials. We will. Uh, Peter says in, uh, in, in um, 1 Peter 4.12, says this, you don't have this, it says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial." You are suffering as though something strange has happened. You know what he said? Now, here's what I'm telling you. My first point in this is if you came and you was thinking Jay's going to talk about depression, not going to happen. Jay's going to give us the answer to anxiety, not going to happen. Jay's going to talk about what the Lord has to say or why God has afflicted me with the pain, not going to happen. What I want you to understand is we live in a broke place. We inhabit a broke body. And Paul and Peter and James and Jesus say, in this world, we will have trouble. We will have affliction. We will have trials. We will have testing. We will have suffering. And, our, and in that, we join in the passion of Christ. Because when God sent his son... I was trying to think, you know, when they say Jesus was perfect, he was perfect in that he understood his relationship with God. Now, I don't know if Joseph didn't put his hand to his butt every once in a while. I don't know if Jesus didn't put a nail in the wrong place. I think Jesus lived a normal life. The scriptures don't seem to indicate he was extraordinary. Okay? He, he made mistakes, but one thing he didn't mistake. He didn't mistake, Randy, who his father was. And he didn't mistake when he, was got, when he had the flu or the H1N1. He didn't mistake who was in charge. He trusted the Father. So my first idea is this. Strong Christians do struggle. Strong Christians do struggle. Now I'm going to say this to you too. Some of you struggle with depression. Some of you struggle with anxiety. Some of you struggle with chronic pain. Some of you struggle with diabetes, asthma, those kinds of things. I know this. Sometimes God does a work and you get relief. Sometimes he calms the malady in us. Sometimes he gives us the ability to persevere. Okay? I, I'm not here to tell you you have depression, anxiety, 
or you got chronic pain because it's sin in your life. Because if that's true, then we all got we all should be afflicted and we all are. I'm saying to you, I don't quite understand why some things go away and some things don't. I can't tell you how many times when I first became a Christian, my best friend was a, a, a Christian two years ahead of me. And he told me this, J.C., if you know the Lord, you shouldn't be struggling with asthma. I say, really? He said, yeah, man. Now, I didn't know the scriptures. I didn't know there was a, a more than two or three hundred verses that talked about suffering. So I bought in. I said, oh, okay. So what do I need to do? He said, you need to pray more. You need to speak in tongues. You need to do a whole bunch of stuff. So I went after doing that. Laying my hands on the TV. Y'all to see me at 2 o'clock at night. Laying my hands on the TV. The t- TV minister to me, Jesus will heal you. I'm like, yes, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. And when I open my eyes, I'm still <gasps> breathing like that the next morning. Okay? He did change my heart. He is changing me to depend on him. But if you ask my wife, we spend lots of money on asthma. It's still here. So if you have depression, and the other thing I want to talk about just because I'm up here is to say this too. If a good, healthy, loving doctor prescribed meds, stay on the meds, please. The people around you don't want you off the meds, okay? Because the truth is anxiety, depression, pain can be dealt with by a good doc, okay? But God will help you persevere. The other thing we need to know is that this is a short stay. It seems like a long stay. But Paul himself was afflicted with something, and he asked God, please. And God said, well, I think you got this. And so he gave him the ability to persevere. He gave him the ability to move through. He supported. I think the issue is about correction. Some of us have things in our life we don't want. Some of us don't have the things we want. And we think if we hook up with God and we we cut the deal with God, he'll cut a deal back. And God says, I cut the deal already. The deal is I love you. I'm going to bless you. I see you, I care about you, I deal sympathetically with you. But he doesn't promise no suffering, no trial, no tribulation. None of that stuff, no trouble. Second idea. So then I started to think about, okay, so if part of the lie is because I don't understand, I get caught up in here versus now, or now versus then. And I want now what I'm going to get promised in heaven. Okay, I get caught up in that. So strong Christians live like they're in heaven now. No, that ain't the way it works. That ain't the way it works. We do struggle. So then I start to ask the question, what in the world is this business about strong? Who gets to call themselves strong? Now, here's what I know. There are places in our fellowships where the strong ones look down on the weak ones. Okay? There are places in this fellowship, not in this fellowship, maybe, I don't know. I, I don't think not in this fellowship, where, where the strong people look down. And you stink, man. I'm getting away from you over here. Look down on the weak ones. And the weak ones hide from everybody else. So I, I asked the scriptures. I started reading, what is this business about strong? And I found this. Who should be considered biblically strong or weak? Paul offers a reframe. Now I would have to put Romans, the whole chapter of Romans 14 and the whole chapter of Romans 15 for you to get the just of it. So I'm going to summarize it. But look at this first verse. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat anything. Another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats anything must not look down on him who does not. The man who does not eat anything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand 
for the Lord is able to make him stand. He goes on to build a case. Strength. Let's look at this. Strength, in some terms, is my ability to have power over a situation. Weakness is my inability to have power or to influence a situation. Strength is my ability to have access to resources that can move mountains. Weakness is poverty. Okay? That's the way we frame it. Strength, strength in this context that Paul was writing in, the, the church at Rome, in, in, in Rome, what was going on was the people who were adhering to the code were calling themselves strength, strong. The people who were praying eight times a day and wearing the shiny coat and sitting at the best places in the church were calling themselves strong. And the people who were struggling with depression and money and, and anxiety, they were looking down on them, calling them weak. And Paul says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Strong Christians struggle, but strong st- Christians who are strong understand the gospel. They don't live under the law. They know that they have nothing to bring to bear except God's love. They know I can't extract more from God by praying 18 times a day. I can't get more blessings by singing in the choir or talking up front. They know the simple gospel that it is because of his love his grace and his mercy that I am one of called one of his kids. And because I'm the king's kid, I got access to everything. Now, it may not look like it because if you look at me right now, I don't look like I'm a, I'm a king's kid. But on that day, when I get my crown, standing up this high, I'm going to be looking at y'all like, yo, yo, look up. Look what the king gave me. Right? And all y'all going to be doing the same thing. Hey, man, you get a pearl? I got a pearl, man. I got a diamond. I got a ruby, man. Check this out over here. Because we, we all king's kids, right? Strong believers understand the gospel. That's what Paul says. Weak believers live under the law. Weak believers think either this. Me, if I promise God, he'll give me this. Or if God gives me this, I better do that. And Paul says that's weak. That's weak faith. That's weak theology. Interesting. He's not talking about whether or not you have stress or strife in your life. Paul didn't define strength or weakness by the absence or presence of depression, anxiety, or pain, or trouble, or finances, or those kinds of things. The strong believer understands the gospel. Interesting. Then I went to the Beatitudes found in Matthew 5. And I thought, you know, that that was the greatest sermon ever preached. And Jesus talked about some stuff there. He said, blessed. Now, I looked that word up. Blessed sounds like this. Sounds like this. The Academy Award goes to Terry. Tammy, the Academy Award goes to first three Beatitudes. Guess what he said? Blessed are the poor in spirit. So strong are the poor. You know what poor in spirit are? Look at me now. I'm at the end of my rope. I'm about to do it. I'm about to jump. Blessed is he or she at the end of their rope. Now, Raise your hand if you know anything about being at the end of your rope. I need a little, I need a little, I need a little crowd involvement. Raise your hand high. You know anything about at your wit's end? I've had it up to here. Bless it. You guys receive the Academy Award. God looks down on you and says, that's my kid. That's my kid. So then I said, okay, that's okay. Poverty of spirit. I don't have any resources left to bring upon change in the situation. Then I looked at the second one. It gets worse, especially for us men. Blessed, Randy, are they who mourn. Now, wait a minute. Now, you men do mourning like this. Yeah, yeah, I miss her, man. That ain't what it means. 
Blessed are they who show the inside gut wrenching on the outside. Blessed are the depressed. Blessed are the anxious. Because they're showing it. I said, wait a minute. Y'all, wait, 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 wait a minute. I, I like to keep my composure on the stress. He said, no, nah, Jay, blessed is the man and the woman who shows their pain. Now, is that good news to anybody? I, I don't hear y'all. Is that good news to anybody? I still don't hear y'all. I want y'all to be like an African-American church, like bang it for me one time. (laughs) Here we go. Here we go. (laughs) See, I should have said that because we got a little crowd over here. (laughs) But the truth is inside out, right? And then the fourth beatitude says something crazy about being persecuted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteous relationships. That, That doesn't mean... Oh, I'm going to read a book about self-esteem. It means, God, I really want to be all I can be for you, and I'm a mess. I want to be a good guy. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good wife. I want to be a good grandma. Please help me. I keep messing it up. Guess what God said? Bless it. I'm saying, dang, man, there's 30 books in the crossroads got it all backwards. Because their thing is, Blessed is the man who is absent, who, who pain is absent, depression is absent, fear. And, and the other thing I want to say is fear, pain, those are all good signals. See, every one of us is going to experience depression. Every one of us is going to be shaken sometime. Every one of us is going to have pain. Okay? Some of us have chronic depression, chronic fear, chronic pain. That still doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Still doesn't mean that. So I, I, that flipped me around. So the reframe is strong Christians do struggle and they're blessed because of their struggle. They're blessed in their struggle. Because the struggle brings me to the end of me. Right? The struggle brings me to a place where I have to do like this. I have to say, you know what? I got nothing. I got nothing. And God says, when you got nothing, I got something. When I say, you know what? I can't do it anymore, God. I'm going to depend on you. Be my dad. God says, I got you. I got you. Now, that promise has to do with this. So strong Christians will experience trouble, affliction, tribulation, persecution, hatred from other people, loss. Okay? Our treasures that we hold on to are going to disappear. Eh? Some of us are going to experience suffering. Some of us will experience loss of reputation. Some of us will experience death. Some of us have. All those things we've experienced. And God looks down from heaven as our father and says, that's my kids. Those are my kids. I love them and I don't want them to believe But because of their circumstances, I'm not in it. I'm not in it. Jesus said, take heart. I've overcome the world. So what he's saying is, I went through it too, y'all. And when you get to where I'm at, oh, man, we're going to dance. We're going to dance. No more tears. No more pain. No more fear. And some people, even in this room, are sitting saying, okay, okay, I got it. So if on the other end of this, there's no more how about we go now? How about, how about we go now? And I'm telling you, that's not a crazy thought. Now, God gets to make the call, but it's not a crazy thought. Some people think, I'm done with this, man. If I could just go home, and I, I was surprised how many times Paul in his ministry said, I, I'm longing for home, man. I want to go now. God, end it. Chop my head off, do whatever you got to do. I want to go home. And, and Jesus said, nah, Paul. Because here's what the deal is. In our struggle, in the struggle is our testimony. In your struggle is your testimony. In your struggle is your witness. In your struggle is your greatness. Not your greatness, his greatness, right? See, I'm a chronic asthma guy who couldn't even breathe walking a 220. And I got a scholarship to play college basketball 
And I remember the coach said, in October, we're going to be on the track. I about passed out. I said, we track? What you mean track? I thought we were just in the gym. Oh, no, a month on the track. Now, we spent three days on the track. I called my grandma. I said, I'm coming home. I said, I can't do this. I'm coming home. She said, no, you need to stay. I had a tall friend named Mike Bayer. He said, you got asthma, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to take you to the doctor. We're going to get you some medicine. Okay? I stayed at that school. Had I not stayed at that school, I don't know what would have happened because I stayed at that school. I met a guy named Garima, the uh, Ethiopian Christian to a Christian college. Does that make any kind of sense? An Ethiopian evangelist came to a Christian college campus, and I said to him, what you doing here? Now, I didn't really want to hear the answer because he said, I came to talk to you. I said, whatever, whatever. He said, I told you you weren't going to believe me. I came to this school. God sent them to this school to talk to you. I said, man, get on out of here, man. April 20th, he said, when I'm done talking, I'm leaving. I said, whatever, man. It's $7,000 a year to go to this school. You leaving. You just checking out. He said, I came to talk to you. And when I'm done, I'm leaving. April 20th, I hit my knees and asked the Lord into my life. April 21st, I went looking for Doc. Now you tell me what happened. I said, Doc, where you at? They said, he's gone. He's up in Lyons, Kansas, working. He was gone. He was serious. I met Doc in May. I said, Doc, I was from here to where you are, right? There. I waved at Doc. I said, Doc, you know what he said to me? I already know. I said, man, I told my friend Joe, let's get out of here, man. This, This Doc dude is weird, man. Let's get out of here. God used my struggle as a way to come to me. I'm standing before you today as a testimony to what he's done. Strong Christians understand the gospel. Strong Christians understand this world is trouble, but I'm connected to the king. There's nothing, there's no circumstance that can separate me from the love of God. That's straight out of Romans. No circumstance can separate you from from the hand of God. Can't happen. Can't happen. Now, I can separate me, I think. I, I act like I can separate because I ain't getting what I want. I have a tantrum. But God just looks down and says, that's my kid. And I'm walking away. I ain't talking to you. And I look behind and he's still walking. Get out of here. I ain't talking to you, man. And he, I look. He's still here. He pursues us. That's strength. So we're strong because God is strong. But in it also, we have weakness. So I done jumped way ahead of myself. Now I'm going backwards. There we go. Lastly, if we're really weak, how many of you know you're weak? Raise your hand. How many know know you're weak? Know you punks. Right? I'm weak. So this body in this world creates an opportunity for extraordinary, an opportunity extraordinaire. Our weakness opens the door to the kingdom. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. To help me from becoming conceited because of my surpassing great revelations, Paul was given some opportunities to see into the future and to see the glory of God. There was given to me a thorn in my flesh. Now, we don't know what that is. We know, we know, we know he struggled with it. A messenger from Satan, which means he he was a tester to torment me. Three times I pleaded. Now, in pleaded, in the Greek, plead means on my knees screaming, banging my chest, Lord, with the Lord to take it away. But Jesus said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulty, in trouble. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Now, that delight 
isn't like, hey, yeah, I got depression. That ain't it. Yeah, I'm scared to death. That ain't it. You know, like, oh, I got pride and pain, but Lord, no, yeah. That ain't it. That ain't it. But it is this notion that in my suffering, I have some place to go. In my suffering, not only does he see me and deal sympathetically with me, he's, he's going to change me. And sometimes that means changing my perspective. But I want you to get this image. When you are weak and you're struggling, and you say, God, help, please. He may not take that struggle away, but he will support you. For him, this, he don't even break a sweat. He don't even break a sweat. He is the prime example of love, caring, and support. It may not feel like anybody's with you. It may not feel like anybody sees it. It may not feel like anybody understands. It may not feel like people are supportive enough. But he knows, and he supports, and he sees you, and he's not shaking his head. He's not irritated with you. He's not disappointed in you because you're not strong enough. He loves you. So strong Christians do struggle. They struggle with fear, depression, pain, this world. They struggle with each other. We struggle with each other. We struggle with ourselves. But our struggle is an opportunity extraordinary to come to know a loving Christ and to come to know a God who promises, promises to meet you where you're at. It's also our struggle does not give us or lack of struggle. See, we have seasons where you don't have hassles. Don't assume you don't have hassles because you live in the perfect Christian life. Your season hasn't come yet. That's the deal. Your season hasn't come. Don't use the absence of this issue or that issue to look down on. Don't use the list and you decide what the big the one, two, and three is and you minimize the little one. Oh, she's living in adultery and I lie all the time. Oh, but my lying ain't that big a deal. Oh, my jealousy ain't that big a deal. Yes, it is. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God. And in God's perspective, a sin is a sin. There's no big and little sin. And sin just makes us highly likely candidates for God's grace. Because God says, I see your sin no more. His perspective is, I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can present to me that makes me change my mind. Strong Christians do struggle. But strong, strong Christians understand the gospel. Strong Christians also know that in their weakness is their greatest kingdom strength. In their weakness, in their struggle, is the greatest kingdom opportunity. In my struggle, I can go back to the people that know me and say, but for the, but for the love of Christ, but for the love of Christ, I stand. I have a song I want to play before I, before I pray. That just as a song by a guy named B. Wright, who talks about this world and his, his pain. Listen to it for a little bit, and then I'll pray. Call the worship team up. And while they're coming up, let me just pray. Dear Father, we, uh, we understand this place. We understand you, you've called us to a broken place. And we have a broken body. But we also understand we don't have a broken relationship with you. We understand that you love us. We understand that you see us. That you care about us. That you sympathize with us. That you deal gently with us. That you change us. That good's ahead, good's guaranteed. 
We ask that you would minister to us. Correct us as we come to understand the lies we believe. Help us to understand what you truly mean by this world. What you truly mean when you, when you, when you talk about strength, being strong, and when you talk about weakness. And what you truly regard when we think about our own weaknesses and our limits. Because in our limits, you become possible. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.